Hello, and welcome back to Leader Up, a podcast of Army Management Staff College. Leader Up is a professional conversation where we discuss a broad range of leadership and leader development topics with an emphasis on the Army civilian professional. I'm your host, David Howey. On today's episode of Leader Up, we've got a great guest who's going to talk about some very timely things that are going on within the Army Civilian Corps. This is Mr. David Brinkley, and he is a member of the Senior Executive Service, and he serves currently as the TRADOC G1, G4. And we're going to talk today uh, with Mr. Brinkley about the CES program in general and about a recent decision that was made uh, that is aimed at getting more supervisors into uh, CES courses. So, Mr. David Brinkley, welcome to Leader Up, and thank you for being here with us today. Yeah, it's my pleasure to join you today. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thank you. And I, I know our I know you've got some uh, interesting stuff to share with our Leader Up audience. So, first first thing I'd like to do is just uh, before we dive into the the subject matter, just a little bit about your background, uh, what you've done in the past, and how you your path to becoming the TRADOC G1, G4. Yeah, thank you. I'd be glad to answer that. Um, Well, I enlisted in the Army about 40 years ago. And uh, then as a specialist, I went to officer candidate school. And then I spent about 27 years as a commissioned officer. I retired as a colonel uh, and then became a a GS civilian. Um. As the a GS civilian, I was the, the G5 of TRADOC, the plans, the, the strategy plans uh, lead. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, fill in for a departing executive, SES, who was the G3 slash 5 or one of the deputy G3s of TRADOC. So I filled in for that job for about eight months and then was encouraged to apply for it when it, you know, formally opened. I did, and I was selected and became a member of the uh, Senior Executive Service. And then I spent the next several years in the TRADOC G3, you know, as uh, the Deputy G3. Uh, I spent uh, several occasions where I was the G3 for a number of occasions when we didn't have a uniform, you know, a general officer as a G3. And uh, I had an opportunity to, uh, if you will, promote up again uh, to a higher level SES and become the uh, G14 of TRADOC. So I have both the HR portfolio and the logistics and facilities infrastructure portfolio. And when I became an executive, there are very few what I would call operational executives or executives that do plans and ops. Most, uh, as a, another senior executive mentor told me, most executives do people and money and logistics. So if you want to continue in the executive career program, you need to find a job that does those type of things. And so, you know, this job that I'm currently in is the, the one and the four does both. I do HR as a, the G1 and I do, you know, the logistics support of TRADOC is the four. So that's kind of how I got here. I've been an executive for uh, almost 10 years now, and I've been a DA civilian for going on 13 years. And and today in, in this episode of Leader Up, we're going to focus for the most part on your, your role as the, the TRADOC G1. And that's kind of where I want to start is talking about this decision that was made uh, on the 18th of November of 2021, uh, the ASA MNRA Civilian Enterprise Steering Committee made a decision, approved a decision that mandated that 80% of CES seats will be filled by supervisors and then the remaining 20% by what's referred to as aspiring leaders. And so we just what will TRADOC's role be in uh, enforcing that decision? And, uh, and then what's TRADOC's, role, what's TRADOC's view or opinion of that decision being made? Right. So just 
truth and lending, I'm a member of that, that committee. So I'm one of the ones that voted on making this happen. Uh, I, uh, I guess I'll get at your questions kind of in reverse order. First off, I think it's a great move. We have a, a significant issue in the Army Civilian Corps and getting our supervisors in particularly trained and educated at the level commensurate with whatever their, their level is, you know, whether it's 14, 15, sevens. Um, we have a, a reluctance of the civilian employee to want to go for a number of reasons to the education. And, uh, and we frankly have a reluctance of supervisors to send their subordinates to uh, these, these education venues. And, and so I wholeheartedly support, if you will, forcing the effort a little bit, one through this, this uh, decision to make sure 80% of the slots are open to supervisors because we got to get the, that gap closed. Uh, how, what's TRADOC doing about it? Well, you know, since we we swore to the parent command for the, you know, the, the Army Management Staff College, so, you know, was part of supporting a subordinate. But the other thing is, I mean, General Funk, the TRADOC commander, has been pretty straight up with his direct reports that, hey, it's your job to develop your subordinates, both military and civilian. And so... Um, you know, he's pushed us very hard and we're pushing our, at least I know I am, uh, pushing our subordinates to get the proper level of training and education and supervision. And I mean, truth and le- a truth, uh, I, I had a discussion with one of my GS-15 directors just this morning about the very same thing, you know, but he needs to get the development he's supposed to have and he needs to make sure his subordinates, you know, are at their levels, go through the same training. But I'm also tracking by name my subordinates that haven't done the required supervisory training. And then when they fall behind, they get to have developmental sessions with me that help reinforce that not only I support this, but that they need to support it and get after it. And that's and and that's kind of something that uh, leaders at any level can do, correct me if I'm wrong, is just take stock of who in your organization has done their CES courses and who hasn't and emphasize to them that that needs to happen. They need to go do that. Um, And you talked a little bit about general funk and I wanted to uh, go to kind of another topic that's related to something that he's done uh, with army management staff college here. uh, And it's related to multi-domain operations. And he, he authorized us, TRADOC authorized us to, hire subject matter experts to enhance our ability to address MDO principles at Army Management Staff College. And so uh, how do you see the role of civilians evolving in that in this MDO environment? Uh, and, and how will civilians, the role of civilians, be different in the future given this MDO environment that we're working in? Right. Well, I think, you know, increasingly one of the NDO tenets is the, you know, the continental of the United States is, if you will, the home base. And that home base is going to be contested in future conflicts. So the civilian workforce uh, is a foundation of that, not so much homeland defense, but the ability to execute MDO and other theaters. So whether it's Civilians working in the in the you know logistics field, uh, most of that you know home base support in the industrial base, which directly supports MDO, is civilians. A lot of our cyber capability, both defensive and offensive, is done by DA civilians. Similar in our intel fields, our signal fields, strategic you know signal and communications. That is increasingly the domain of the Army civilian where, and that frankly, their readiness to do, uh, if you will, their combat mission, even though they're going to be fighting from an office, you know, in the United States, um, is critical. And critical to that readiness, no different than a military member going to professional military education, it's critical that those civilians not only get the technical training they need, 
but also the leader development training that uh, they need, again, commensurate with their grade and their specialty. And as we're pushing more um, STEM type positions to be increasingly populated with civilians, uh, thereby creating the, you know, putting the uniforms, if you will, in the fighting elements and the civilians are in the supporting elements. I, I, again, I think it's critical that these civilians get to uh, civilian education system and get, get trained and educated at their levels in support of MDO. And I, I think that manifests itself with the approval to put the subject matter experts in the staff college to get after the MDO education. I mean, it's very similar to what we did with Airland Battle way back 30 years ago, is we wanted to make sure that our growing force understood Airland Battle. And so that was put into the courses. MDO is really no different uh, from, uh, you got to understand the concept and the doctrine behind it if you're going to be effective in that type of organization. And and that's kind of a little different, um, a, a different view than we had 20 years ago, which was kind of the greening of the army to get the, the, the green suitors uh, back into the force. And then the civilians were called upon to do the stability and continuity. And now what, what you're saying and what, what we're hearing about this MDO environment is that it's, it's not just the stability and continuity. It's, it's a direct part of the fight that's going on now that, that we're calling on army civilians to be a part of. And so, and so what, what is Tradoc's vision of, of that, of acquiring and developing the leaders that, that have those capabilities to be able to fight and win in that MDO environment? Well, I think as we talk with cyber, it's becoming increasingly clear to at least me that, you know, our civilian employees are going to have, if you will, and I'll, I'll say this in air quotes, the same lethality in whatever their field is, or maybe readiness, uh, without physically stepping foot on the battlefield. I mean, we do have exponential civilians uh, who go overseas for various reasons, but the vast majority of the Army civilian force is going to, if you will, fight from home station uh, in whatever their fields are. Um, and so, you know, again, I think that we've got to have a system where the civilians seamlessly integrate with the military in these sort of fields, not be separate and included or in a different stovepipe. And, and so, again, I think what we're seeing, you know, from a staff college perspective is an intent to have them trained together or if not together, at least to trained on the same type of things at at grade. So, you know, we want our 13s and 14s to have the same level of civilian education commensurate to what we're teaching our majors and lieutenant colonels in staff college. Um, so the other thing that I think we're going to see is uh, I think the civilians owe it to the commander that they work for to be as, if you will, prepared to, as they possibly can to get after whatever their mission set is. And again, a key component to that readiness is training and education. Part of it's experiential learning. You know, I'm on the job and I know, but, you know, frankly, for a lot of years, we promoted people to high levels because they did really well at something beforehand. You know, a term I use is the cube commando. I was a great cube commando. I got hired as a GS-5. I was a great cube commando. So I got to be a GS-7 cube commando. Now I find myself as a GS-13 supervisor and leader of other, and, and again, I don't mean that pejoratively. I'm just saying it's, it's I guess to use another analogy, I was a great salesman and now I'm the sales manager. And so, but I don't know how to manage salesmen. I know how to sell things because I haven't been set up for success as I moved up the ladder to take on that leadership role. And I, and I think the, you know, CES is the rungs on the ladder. So that when I move into the 
supervisor of people, I now have the skills and abilities to do that effectively. Uh, yeah, and abs- you're absolutely correct. And I, I've, I, I've taught in the basic course and the intermediate course uh, for years. And I, I hear that uh, is that people are experts in their functional area, but they there's a need for them to become experts in the in the field of being a leader or a supervisor, uh, whichever one, and they're, and those are a little bit different, uh, but absolutely. And we feel like at, at AMSC that we can satisfy that requirement if we get the folks uh, to, to come through their grade appropriate CES course. And I like to kind of, uh, let me kind of return to that decision that that, that committee made and uh, talk about readiness. Uh, this decision was made to get uh, more civilian supervisors into CES courses. And so how will that impact uh, and how has CES impacted uh, Army readiness? Well, it's interesting because one of the things we have kind of circled back and forth on it with the, uh, the Army level is on How do you measure civilian readiness? I mean, military readiness is really easy. I mean, are you updated dental? Are you updated medical? Are you physically fit? I can measure that by, you know, your medical visits, your scores on the, you know, Army fitness test. Uh, Are you uh, skilled in whatever your skill is? Have you gone to the commensurate professional military experience that you need to to continue to move up, you know, up the ladder, and if you will, and uh, you know the military's an up and out system, so you've got to hit those education gates. I mean, a good example is, you know, with the step program for the NCOs. You don't get the P is promoted. That's the last one. The training and education are before that. They're the T and the E part of step. So we don't have a similar system with the civilians. I mean. You can come in as a civilian and be an expert at something and never move, never really, other than getting in-step promotions. You don't have to, there's no up and out, if you will. So we got to encourage those folks to still develop because the fact that you were the best at whatever that is 10 years ago doesn't mean that you can't be better now because maybe things changed from when whatever you were doing 10 years ago. And I know that's sort of the, you know, the downside of looking at civilians. I mean, one is continuity, but the other is, well, you guys are all, you know, locked in the past. And I think, again, where, you know, the Army Management Staff College comes in is, hey, we've got to re-blue you. And if you want to be the GS 13 step 10 your whole career, I'm good with that. It still means we have to develop you. And we have to improve your skill sets for however what you do has changed in the modern world. And so I, I think that, so again, how we measure readiness for civilians, it's not that you go to the dentist, that you get a physical, you know, can you pass a PT test? But I do think you get after civilian readiness with training and education, with civilian wellness programs. You know, they encourage you to be fit physically, because if you're fit physically, you're going to be in the office more you're not going to be sick and you're not going to be, you know, not available. And then the more we can train and educate you, the more mentally and emotionally you're going to be in a better state to do these very complex tasks that we're seeing uh, that we're asking our civilians to do to come out of, you know, MDO. I mean, no longer are we all stamping, you know, stamping hubcaps. So I can sit there and kind of be a drone all day. And as long as I, meet my hubcap uh, quote, I'm good. We know now we, we have to be critical thinkers to get after the MDO environment. And, and again, I think what the staff college offers is the training and education that enables that readiness. And, you know, I've, I've heard people say that uh, the fact that an army civilian or member of the army civilian corps can stay in a job for five, 10, 15, 20 25 years is, is simultaneously one of the great strengths of the Army Civilian Corps and at the same time, one of the great weaknesses. So it's a really good thing to have that stability, but at the same time, 
uh, it can cause folks to get stale or just lose track of, of kind of what they're doing. Yeah, I, I get asked a lot, uh, you know, how do you get to be an SES, you know, or a GS-15? And what I tell people is, well, there's two things. One, you have to be willing to seek jobs of higher opportunity and skill sets, and you have to be willing to move. And so if you're not willing to move and take on jobs of greater responsibility, then you're not going to, because again, it's not an up and out. You only get promoted as a civilian if you seek a position that has a promotion with it. And, and most of that is, is, is voluntary. It is a, a, an intrinsic motivation within the person to do that. Uh, and, and one of the things that I hear a lot, uh, I do some work with the school for command prep and these military officers, battalion and brigade commanders ask me, how can I get my civilians to develop themselves? And so I'm, I'm just, just, uh, going to ask you the same question. What's the best approach for, for the army to use for the, the either green suit or civilian to get civilians uh, into their grade appropriate uh, CES courses. What are some ways, some other ways to do that? Well, I mean, um, for me, uh, it's one of their <laughs> their their performance objectives. If they're supervisors, is um, you know, are you appropriately trained, and have you ensured your your developmental or the development of your subordinates? So, and so part of that is you know. CES is, is, is part of that. Also, you know, developmental assignments, you know, getting people interested in their own self-development is, you know, we run a program in TRADOC, you know, for our civilians that uh, uh, is designed to be a leader development program and to augment the CES program. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we're increasingly bringing in a lot of interns that are kind of junior for CES, but through their, you know, kind of local leader development programs, you can kind of prime the pump for them as they move up from the, you know, the four or five, seven arena into where now they need to go to, to the basic course. And you can kind of build that up front with, hey, it's important that you continually get developed. And at different parts of your career, there are different opportunities. But I really think it goes back to the supervisor has got to buy into it and has got to see that as a way of improving their organization. And whether you're a, a long-term, I'm going to do this, whatever it is forever, I got it. You still got to come up with a development program for them. CES is part of that. Uh, or, hey, I think you're a mover up and you're a potential whatever, uh, you know, five, six years down the line. And for you to reach that, you're going to have to do this. And again, CES is part of that. You got to go to the basic course. You got to go to the advanced course. You ought to be competing for, you know, going to command and general staff college or going to the army war college. Now, again, I know you send a civilian to the army war college. They are in fact a loss to you. So but if you look at it, it's a loss to me. So I'm not going to support it. I think you're, you're being tactical in your approach. If you look at it as, I'm sending you to the Army War College because it's going to improve Army readiness as you go to the next level of your Army civilian career. It's good for the Army. And so, so again, I think that's how you get after this theme of readiness with civilians is, one, you got to encourage them to do it. Two, they've got to see that that was a good thing for them. And three, you got to get your subordinates to underwrite and support that employee going and getting those experiences. And uh, th thank you for the, for those responses. I want to ask you about two more things. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, let you get back to work. Uh, the first one is uh, ACMA, this organization that, that was created uh, about a little more than a year ago uh, that is supposed to have the uh, responsibility to oversee the, the, the kind of the functional training part of it, uh, or, and to oversee the, the, the career fields. And so what's the importance of ACMA and, and what is TRADOC's relationship with ACMA? Um, 
So before ACMA, basically you had a flower blooming in every career field. And some career fields did exceptionally well at developing training programs, getting funding to get the people in that career program trained. A perfect example of that is the Corps of Engineers, Career Program 18. They've got a program from GS1 to SES. It's well-funded. They have direct hire authority. They have all kinds of advanced civil schooling opportunities on top of the CES. It's well-funded. It's well-organized. It's well done. Then you got other ones like what most of the Army civilians are in, the infamous Career Program 51, that basically was a catch-all for all the career fields and people that didn't fit well and and nobody wanted to do. And there was basically no opportunity for any of this in 51. And some have been really good and now fallen off. Um, some are growing. Uh, so, but it was basically a bunch of stovepipes and no one ever pulled them together and said, hey, here's an army vision for civilian career development. And so ACMA is trying to get after that. Now, I would tell you they're still getting their arms around it a little bit. And uh, frankly, the field's kind of trying to learn through it as well. So a career program that was very robust and well-managed was Career Program 32, which is, you know, primarily your training developers and those kind of things in TRADOC. You know, that historically had been run from headquarters TRADOC. Very well done. It's now run from ACMA. And so uh, the person that used to run it from TRADOC those employees that work for him that did CP32, they no longer work for him. They work with him. So he has got a significant job in advising ACMA on how Career Program 32 should go, but not in charge of it anymore. Um, and so, you know, there's some growing pains there. Um, I think any time you can pull stovepipes together into one, I mean, I use a plumbing analogy. Once you get all the pipes connected to one manifold, you're going to get better flow. But the flow has got to work both ways. So, you know, the career programs that were strong before, they're still pretty strong. Uh, they are taking a look at what I would call the great amount of people in 51 and kind of deciding, should you be more in this career program or that one? And I think that's all good work. Um to to get after it and so i do i think it'll be a good thing yes uh they're but they're still kind of growing into their role and uh and you know i i, I see some bright light coming down the tunnel and i guess i don't really think it's to train yet i think it's we're getting to the edge of the tunnel and and we'll see i mean the biggest issue with most of the career program functional training was funding and those that got a lot of funding did really well. Those that did not get a lot of funding did not. But we're trying to, you know, the other thing they picked up was the interim program. And we are vastly expanding the interim program within TRADOC um, because we see that as the way to the future. I mean, most of my employees are retirement eligible. Most of TRADOC's employees are retirement eligible. Most of the Department of the Army's civilian employees are retirement eligible. So how do you get new blood in, which means you get new thinking, new experiences, and it helps you get away from the stagnant, stale, you know, here's how we did it in the Cold War kind of thing that you hear periodically. And it's through the interns. So, and so again, as we work through those interns, which are funded through the career programs, for the most part, I mean, there's a multitude of career, of intern programs, you know, we kind of have to work each one of those as almost a, a bespoke item where I would like to get it to where it's like, hey, we're bringing them in. Here's the program. And whether we're bringing them in here at Fort Eustis or bringing them in at, at Fort Leavenworth, if they're in this career program, this is how it works. And we're still a little bit of rolling our own for each individual one. But again, that's getting better. I think we're teaming with a number of major universities to get interns in. Because, again, I think that's the Department of the Army Civilian of the future. And I would tell you these these young people are all about career development. Because I'm coming back to, you know, your job in the Army Staff Management, the Army Management Staff College. They really want to get development and have new experiences and different experiences. 
And if you can't provide that to them, they leave government service like that. They're not staying around for 20 years if, if we don't keep them excited about it. And how you do that is through the, the you know, education and training process. And, and that's, that's a, a generational issue also because people of uh, maybe an older generation are looking for security and stability in a career, whereas younger folks, I know sometimes I hear my son talk about job satisfaction Mm-hmm. Is is more important than that stability thing that uh, that maybe an older generation focused on. Yeah. So these people want to be developed, and and they want to have uh, they want to do work that has has great meaning, um, either for themselves or for the community that they uh, are supporting. Yeah, and I I'd be honest with you, with the interns we've had, I've been super impressed with them. I mean, they are they are excited. They. Uh, um, they want to learn. They're willing to take on new challenges. And frankly, they're <laughs> to the chagrin of some of my 12s and 13s, they're solving problems pretty quickly that some of my folks have been like struggling with for a while. And just because they, they kind of have a fresh look at things and go, well, what about this? And we all go, we never thought of that. And so to me, it's great. But again, the, the, I, I think we owe it to them to develop them. And, and again, working through that with ACMA, because again, ACMA is a little bit still, well, this is how we used to, we wanted to do business in the old way. Well, you're not in the old way anymore. So you got to kind of revise some of your thoughts on program development as well. And so when, uh, when, when I asked you about ACMA, I said I had two more questions. So now yep. I'm, I'm kind of down to my last one. And the last question is this, uh, you're a member of the uh, the Senior Executive Service, and so the symbol of that is that keystone that's in the center of an arch. And so just from, from your perspective, what does that keystone symbolize? What does it mean to you uh, for, for that for folks in, in, in the Senior Executive Service to, to be represented by that uh, image? Right. I mean, a slightly funny aside is General Perkins one time told me it was the best military symbology because it represented a full beer glass. Uh, but uh, really, the reason they came up with the design when they established the uh, senior executive service in the 70s, because originally uh, in the, in, you know, before the senior executive service, I'd be a GS-17, you know, um, but they wanted to establish a flag officer level of civilians, much like general officers do for the military. And so that keystone is designed to represent, I mean, if you if you understand what keystones do from an engineering perspective, that's what holds the arch up. And so if the arch is the civilian workforce, what keeps it from crumbling is that keystone that locks it in. Uh, and that's why there's one keystone, but many other stones in the art. So I think, you know, from an executive standpoint, you know, our job is to make sure that that arch stays locked and strong. And because that arch that's, is the civilian foundation that underpins army success. So, you know, so again, we go back to MDO, you know, we're the foundation that allows, you know, you to go do what you need to do from an MDO standpoint on the uniform side, but again, I think where the SES has come in is, you know, where what locks that arch up and makes it so strong. So it can take the pressure uh, that's put on it and, and, and survive. Okay. Well, Mr. David Brinkley, thank you so much for uh, being with us today on Leader Up and uh, talking about all of these issues. I know uh, you've helped uh, a lot of folks out in the Leader Up audience understand some of these things a little more clearly. So Thank you for your time, sir. We do appreciate it. No, and it was a pleasure being with you again. And, uh, you know, if there's an opportunity for me to come back on another subject, feel free. I would love to join you again. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And so, Leader Up audience, you just heard uh, Mr. David Brinkley from TRADOC talking about the uh, civilian education system. And so, if you are a supervisor out there, find out the status of your folks regarding their CES courses 
And if they haven't done them, encourage them to go. And if you yourself haven't gone through your uh, great appropriate CES course, sign up and get it done and um, be an example for uh, the rest of the Army. And uh, thank you for being with us. And join us again next time for another episode of Leader Up. As always, if you have any questions or feedback or would like to learn more about our podcast, please check the description for our email and for our website. Thanks for listening.